John Golia. I'm Greg Fife. And I'm Todd Curtis. And we are the Flight Safety Detectives. Between us, we have over a century of aviation accident investigation and safety experience to draw on as we discuss issues that affect all of us. So we are qualified to share our perspectives on accidents and incidents and what can be learned from them for the future. We're proud to say that we have two sponsors that really relate to the topic of aviation safety. The Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, or PAMA, and Avemco Insurance. Later on in the show, we'll tell you how you can get a 5% discount on your insurance just for listening to the show. We don't just dissect the official reports. In every episode, we identify safety issues and take the mystery out of accident investigations. So maybe pilots in their planes can have safer flights ahead. Well, hello, John. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives, and uh, looks like you and I are flying a two-ship today since uh, Todd is in uh, places out yonder somewhere. So, uh, you know, it's good to see you as always, and uh, I am traveling as well. And, uh, you know, it's going to be a busy time before Christmas for me. I'm sure it's going to be the same for you. Yes, I'm off tomorrow morning at boarding at 5.30 a.m. to start my week. There, there you go. You know, it's what happens when you're in demand, my friend. Yeah. Home, I came home on Sunday and leaving on, yeah. uh, on Wednesday. Welcome to the life of accident investigators. And say, so, yeah. Never- Try to prevent them. I don't want to go to crash sites. I want to prevent them. Yeah, really. Well, I think we have a, an accident that we're going to talk about today where we're fortunate that no one was killed and they could have been easily killed in this particular event. But there's also a secondary issue that we don't see very often, and that is uh, where we have not only a, a potential for a cover up, but of course, the prosecution. Of uh, of a very high executive in a uh, in a charter company, you got the director of maintenance who uh, who ends up being um, a fall guy um, for very good reasons um, in an event that uh, could have easily taken the life of not only pilots but uh, any of the passengers that may have been on that aircraft. Yeah, well, I want to talk a little bit about that at the end, a little different spin on it. Yeah. Yeah. You want to go over it and then I'll talk about it or you want me to? Yeah, why don't you do it? You know, I'll I'll chime in and give you commentary. So, yeah, way back in 2017, we had a Piaggio that was uh, out of Florida, based out of Florida, but was uh, actually in California flying around. And the uh, came out of Camarillo. And the first officer had a little bit of trouble with his flight controls coming out of there, but the airplane flew fine. And they went on to uh, San Diego to pick up some passengers. And then uh, from San Diego, they went to Henderson, Nevada, uh, where they uh, unloaded the passengers and then had a problem. And they discovered in in Nevada that the elevator was missing on the right-hand side. And... Uh, unfortunately, for the previous pre-flight, and I hop on pre-flights all the time, you pre-flight in San Diego, uh, the elevator was totally missing there. And how do you how do you explain that? It wasn't yeah. loose. It wasn't anything, it wasn't there. All right. So the airplane took off without it. So we got a flight crew that has an issue, uh, a couple of issues. We'll talk about the the other one, and. Uh, so the airplane is in the, in Nevada. They make a call back to home base in Florida, and that starts a whole bunch of events. The FAA is involved. Uh, the NTSB gets involved uh, after notification. So it was like it was going on for 
a day at least before they even notified the uh, NTSB. And so it was a, a uh, not a very good start to an accident investigation. NTSB ultimately went out there and they found the, three days later, the missing elevator was found back in Camarillo. So on that takeoff where the first officer on the voice recorder makes a comment about the elevator, uh, that's why he made a comment because it dropped off the airplane then. And yeah, it's definitely going to change the uh, takeoff performance if you're missing one half of the elevator since. Uh, yeah. you know, and the other side, the highway was loose. Yeah. But what happened? What happened here is this airplane had been in for maintenance 28 days before, and is an AD note out against the elevators. That's AD means a mandatory inspection in this case against the elevators. So they had to disassemble the elevators from the airplane, perform the AD note, and then reinstall them. Well, apparently they reinstalled them and they reused the, the self-locking nuts and didn't torque them. Hmm. And a short time later, uh, they both loosened up, but the right one seemed to loosen quicker. Now, I don't know why, maybe it wasn't as tight. You know, maybe it was only finger tight. I don't know. But in any event, the, the hardware took a walk away from the airplane, and then the elevator followed soon after. The airplane flew for 128 hours with loose hardware. You know, and and let me just stop you there, John. When you when we talk about loose hardware, you know, this this is a twin engine turboprop airplane. It's a T-tail airplane. So Trying to do a pre-flight with a tail that's probably what 15 feet or thereabouts up in the air. It's at um, least 12. Yeah, and so you don't have the ability to go out there and yank on the uh, on the elevator as a as a pilot. Just like many you know pilots, you know you can't go out there and start yanking on big airplane you know flight controls. But um, is there is there anything that would have been characteristic or unusual about the sight picture? Because we all learn as a pre-flight when we're looking at airplanes, you've been flying this Piaggio, you know, things sh should have a, quote, normal look. And is there anything that would have been at least visible to make it look abnormal with loose elevators? They might have been able to see the, the, the hinges on the elevator from the ground. Uh, and they also may have been able to see the bolts backing out. Yeah. So, you know, and I'm not, you know how much I, I hop at the show at the end of every show about yeah. three flights. There's all sorts of things you can do. You know, one of the things uh, you could go in and you could shake the yoke. Yeah. And, and both ways, shake it. And if there's something loose, you're going to feel it. Yeah. And you may even hear it. I mean, it's just going to be sloppy. It's right. not going to be, it's not going to, you know, have that nice tight fit kind of feel to it, the tactile. And that's the importance, you know, of going in and actually when you're doing a, a pre-flight inspection, whether it's on a 172 or a jet, or in this case, this twin engine turboprop, where you don't just yank and bank on the, uh, on the controls just to go through the motions. You're actually feeling for things through that tactile feedback, you know, is there ratcheting? Is Does this flight control feel sloppy? Does it feel loose? Um, can you hear a rattling that you didn't hear before? I mean, that's the importance of really being in tuned with, with your aircraft. And like you said, John, this airplane had been flying around for 128 hours with loose fittings. I can't imagine that in that 128 hours, plus these guys were complaining about pitch issues with the airplane. Yet they didn't report it, as I read, um, you know, immediately. They didn't, you know, talk to, to maintenance about it. They just kept flying the airplane. Right. You know, we both worked Emory 17. And in that airplane, uh, the crew, particularly the first officer, was so in tune with his airplane that he could feel a mere 40 pounds difference in pressure on the control column. Yep. Right and and had been complaining about it, yeah. About the, the it feels different. It feels the controls feel heavy. Yeah. And yeah, uh, if you're in tune with your airplane, 
if you spend the time to understand the airplane that you're flying, you'd be amazed at what comes out, what pops out, and what you're able to determine very easily. But I, but the first thing you have to do is you have to do the pre-flight. And as I've said many times, looking at, at these uh, corporate airplanes, uh, the 135 charters and, and, uh, and corporate 135s, I see some pretty sorry uh, walk-arounds. And if well, it's raining, and raining, all we see is uh, protect my shoes, do dodge the, the puddles, and forget the airplane. Well, in this case, those guys were running behind schedule. So, again, now you have self-induced pressure. They're trying to maintain a schedule. They're already, they know they're behind the power curve there. So it's going to be one of those kick the tires, light the fire, let's get out of here kind of free flights. It's not going to be, um, you know, your nominal or typical thorough and methodical. Um, they're trying to make up time. They blast the destination. They're only on the ground five minutes to pick up passengers. I mean, there's no time to do anything other than try to make, you know, schedule. And, you know, it's the little things. I mean, hell, for all they knew, um, you know, that elevator could have been hanging off the back of the airplane, <laughs> you know. Wait, that caused a bigger problem, right? Yeah. The fact that it left the airplane was probably a blessing. Yeah. Absolutely, because, uh, you know, if that thing had been blown around and beat into the rudder or anything, now you've got multiple flight control issues. So, you know, we impress, and I in particular, hop on the pre-flight inspection. And I keep asking Todd about the different instructors he's had. He's now on the West Coast flying. He's flying today. And about what they tell him for pre-flights and it's all over the place. Yeah. His instructors are all over the place. What has changed with Todd in his pre-flights is after listening to us and what we find on the, on the, in the accidents, he now is going way beyond what any of them have told him to look for. You know, and, and uh, a while ago we had, uh, he had us on the show where the airplane he rented had a wing replaced yeah. And he and he went after all the data. They don't even have the logbooks out at the flight school. Yeah. And yeah. he went after the data uh, to make sure the airplane was airworthy. So it, it's all over the place. I think the FAA needs to increase the education piece uh, for pre-flights. And I, I noticed, having said that, I noticed that uh, in some of the, uh, in their, their safety seminars, there's some of their FAA inspectors are starting to talk about the pre-flight. So maybe they're listening to the broadcast, but it is a serious problem. And it's just, it's just a shame. And I get, when I query some of the pilots, especially corporate pilots, I'll ask them, I, you know, I, I can remember on the Challenger, I, you didn't open up the panels on the nose above the nose gear. And they, they just sort of shrugged. And, and one of them told me, he says, I look in there. I don't know what I'm looking at. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you learn? I don't, you know, it's a busy place. There's all sorts of linkages, lines, everything in there. All right. But all look at all the attachment points. You don't have to get your hands dirty. You don't have to do any of that. Just look. Is there, is there a, a self-locking nut? Know the difference between a castellated nut and a self-locking nut. If it's a castellated nut, it needs to have a cotter pin in it. Okay. And so, so look for that. And most linkages are caught a pin because they want to be loose. You don't want to tighten them up too tight and jam, although that's not 100% true. But most of them are, are uh, with caught pins. Flight controls are always with caught pins. Yeah. So it's, you know, they should, as a pilot, you should learn those little things about the airplane you're flying. And as I say, and I'm going to say again tonight, at the end of the show, you know, if you don't know what you're looking at, grab a mechanic and say, come over here and show me, show me what I should do when I look inside this panel. You know, and you, you bring up an interesting point, John, because I just had this conversation with our friend, Tony. He was the young man we had on his show um, oh, almost two years ago. Now, when you and I were at Embry-Riddle, we had him on our show. He's one of the, one of the young men that I'm uh, mentoring. He is now a senior at Embry-Riddle. He just got his MEI. He's going to be working for Embry Riddle as a uh, as a flight instructor, 
and we were having a conversation at dinner and came home for Thanksgiving. And one of the things I asked him was, you know, about pre-flight. And he's been going down to the maintenance shop over at Embry-Riddle, pulling mechanics aside, saying, okay, teach me about, you know, this or teach me about that. He's got his peer group asking, why are you doing that? And of course, Tony, being the conscientious guy, and of course, listening to us and, and being involved with our show, he knows the importance of, of you know, doing a thorough pre-flight and really understanding the airplane that he's flying. And and he, his peer group is going, that's just a waste of time. Why are you spending so much time doing that? You don't need to be doing that. That's the attitude, John. And that's the wrong attitude. And if we don't emphasize it now, and the FAA doesn't emphasize it, especially through DPEs on check rides, you're going to have people out there flying hardware that has no business ever getting in the air. And I know that a lot of the DPEs that I know, especially uh, sitting on the, uh, the board of the National Association of Flight Instructors, a lot of these um, candidates, and it's not just student pilots going for a private. I mean, we're talking commercial, we're talking multi-engine, we're talking ATP. They aren't making it out the door to go fly the airplane because they don't understand the maintenance records. And I mean, unless you understand what you're looking at or the purpose, and I always talk about it, I preach it, it's one of my mantras, and that is you train with purpose so that you can execute with purpose. You don't just go out there and, you know, yank and bank and pull up on, on flight controls, not understanding what you're doing. And oh, by the way, if that's all you're going to do is flip it up and down because someone told you, hey, yeah, go move it and make sure that it works and not understand it, you're going to put that airplane in the air with a problem that you technically just looked at, but you never identified. Yeah. In fact, we've seen a number of reports just like that. Yeah. All right. So this, this case gets even better because after the, it landed in San Diego and the, and the flight crew realized that, that the elevator had taken a vacation from the airplane and they called back to report it, apparently their director of maintenance had a one of those moments where he realized that they probably messed up with the inspection because he quickly called out to the contract maintenance person in San Diego and had him go out and take the hot and drop off. No, Are you Henderson. sure it was San Diego? Oh, no, Henderson. 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 And take all the hardware off and immediately send it back to headquarters in Florida. Yeah. And so, the, so that mechanic did that. But he also told the mechanic to go out and power up the airplane for 30 to 45 minutes. And the mechanic did not do that. And the next day. In, in fact, the, the mechanic questioned, why do you want me to power up the aircraft when I'm, you know, working on the elevator? Right. And uh, he, he told him he wanted to run the, the CVR. And he didn't do it. The next day, the the director of maintenance in Florida called out again and asked this kid if he had put the power in the airplane. The kid told him, no, and I'm not going to. So he refused yeah. to do it. And when the NTSB arrived that day and they grabbed the flight data recorder and voice recorder, I should say, and, and uh, sent it off to Washington and they had uh, 30 good hours or uh, 30 minutes uh, of good recording uh, quality audio and they were able to determine a lot. They were able to determine that the first officer had that problem. The crew had talked about it. So, yep. so the maintenance maintenance screwed up, and the flight crew, just in the interest of keeping the airplane moving, uh, yep. disregarded. They thought they could handle it, and, and kept on going. And it's a mistake. So then, what happens is the uh, the voice recorder impeaches this this. Uh, the maintenance program, and then they start digging in, and the, the mechanic in Henderson says to the NTSB what this guy had told them to do, yeah. and now the FAA it becomes criminal. And I know you and I both have worked in cases that had uh, criminal implications to it, and and this particular individual uh, ultimately uh, was taken to court uh, and charged with a, an, an offense. So that's goodbye is say goodbye to your A and P license then. 
right? Because once you get that, it's gone, revocated on the spot. And uh, if you go to the judge, you're not going to get it back anyway. And uh, the company got a $16 million fine, which ultimately put them out of business uh, because there is no insurance of that kind of uh, misadventure. And so the, the company is gone, it's history, and the DOM went to jail. It doesn't, the reports apps are quiet on if the FAA did anything to the pilots, but I'm sure they had to because oh, of it was It was so egregious, John, and the board identified the pilots as being a contributing factor to this event. Um, the fact that the, you know, they were out there, they didn't do what they were supposed to do as professional pilots. They weren't reporting mechanical issues, um, which this was a critical mechanical issue. And, and the fact that uh, they chose to fly an unairworthy airplane and, and you know, move the metal to accomplish the mission, and that was delivering paying passengers. Um, but this company has had a history of this because about four or five years prior to this event, um, they had another event that took place and an investigation found that they were robbing parts off of other customers' airplanes that they were managing. They were taking parts off their airplane to keep a, you know, one or two or three other airplanes going. And again, I mean, it's robbing Peter to pay Paul. They were playing a shell game. So, you know, what was going on with the money were definitely what was going on with management um, trying to operate on a shoestring and, and turn a profit the whole time. Uh, I did a, a, an accident years ago, back in the early 90s, involving a Lear jet that crashed at Morristown. And it was a well-known charter out of Allentown, Pennsylvania, a charter company that had a history of, you know, shady operation. And in fact, people, a couple of guys that I had graduated college with actually flew for them. So when they heard about this accident, I got a phone call saying, you got to check this. You got to check. They gave me basically a shopping list because I was working the accident at the time. Um, I went in there. They were keeping double sets of pilot records. They were keeping double sets of, of um, maintenance records um, so that when the FAA came in, they saw the pretty records, but the actual records didn't reflect all the, all the bad stuff that was going on. They were robbing parts off of brand new airplanes by very prominent customers putting them on their old garbage airplanes and then billing the customer, the, the prominent customer for new parts. I mean, this is the kind of stuff that, you know, you don't see on a daily basis because there hasn't been an accident or incident. And, you know, once that happens, then you, of course you start sticking your nose and you start finding a lot of bad stuff. And as we all know, we've been banging on the FAA, the NTSB bangs on the FAA, Congress bangs on the FAA. For, you know, not having the ability to do their job as, as far as oversight. But guess what? Without the resources, they can't be all places doing all things like that. They have to be very selective. And, and so, you know, yes, there are going to be accidents and incidents involving, you know, not only serious injury, but unfortunately fatalities. The question is, how do we do, how do we get in there and actually oversee this and trap line it and, and find out that this kind of stuff is going on before it leads to an event. Yeah, well, with, with the FAA being down so many uh, people, you know, their headcount is, is way down again. And uh, they ride a hell of a roller coaster. You know, they'll get in trouble. Congress will go nuts. They'll get the money that, that they should have been receiving all along. They'll hire, ramp up all their employees to the levels that they're supposed to have. And I think flight standards has around 7,000 uh, employees and flight standards are the policemen for the FAA. They're the guys out there every day on the airports looking around, but there's not enough of them to go to the airports every day. We rely upon the ethics of the pilots and mechanics and others in the business. And uh, today that seems to be a bit of a problem well, with uh, not everybody has the same standards of ethics that we had uh, 30 years ago. So and that's a society problem, not an aviation problem as such. So we have all that brewing. And today we have additional problems. Uh, we have a, a, a mechanic workforce that was 
was just cut loose during the pandemic. We've, we've put out the pasture thousands of mechanics and now we have a steady influx now of not enough mechanics, but there's new ones coming in, no experience, no common sense. Right? So there is a level of, of that doesn't sound like right, that doesn't look right, that comes with people that have been around airplanes for a while. And that's all missing right now. I just did an IA renewal, and that's inspection authorization. Those are mechanics that are allowed to do the detailed inspections on, on uh, airplanes. And I just did a renewal just uh, recently. And the uh, one of the things I said to them is that, you know what, we are our brother's keeper. And we need to make sure that we pay attention to all these new mechanics coming in and make sure they learn uh, the right way of what needs to be done and why we're doing it that way. I mean, we, I see accidents or incidents now with hardware that's installed wrong. Not every nut and bolt just gets stuck in the hole. There's sometimes a way that you want to put it in. Uh, it's called out in the regulations, but you see it over and over again where guys uh, don't understand it and don't do it. So it's, it's a complicated business in the cockpit, complicated business on the ground, and we need yeah. to pay attention. And pilots that, that fail to do a good walk around are as, are as culpable as the mechanic who screws up the installation or something. I agree. So, and, and we see it over and over and over again. And it's just, it is very frustrating because um, we're not... <laughs> We're not creating new ways to hurt ourselves or kill ourselves. I mean, you know, we talk about it over and over and over again. That's why when you do trending, you know, you put, uh, you know, some keywords into the NTSB database and it pulls up thousands of accidents for the same reasons. And, you know, apparently, you know, a lot of people aren't getting the message. Now, we have done a good job of not crashing big airplanes in a long time, which is good. The problem is, is that we have a lot of precursors out there now. All these near, um, you know, uh, events on the ground, you know, these near misses on the ground, the near misses in the air, um, you know, putting airplanes in, in airspace with other airplanes in close proximity. The whole system right now is is a bit fragile, and um, and we really got to take a step a uh, step back and take a deep breath and get it collectively together before we run two big airplanes together on the ground or in the air, or we have a major catastrophic um, hull loss. Um, we've done a good job of avoiding that since about 2001, but never say never. Right. In fact, I see complacency sliding in a number of different areas. Right. Just, you know, we've gotten... We have such a good record. Everybody's resting on their roles instead of looking closely. So with this director of maintenance trying to do this cover up and, and of course, um, you know, spending time in jail, um, you know, he is he is completely gone. You think that it was one of those things where it was like, catch me if you can. I'm going to outsmart the system. Why do you think a guy would do that? He didn't want to get the violation. Yeah, he didn't want the violation. So I, I suspect he might have had inspection authorization himself, which would be gone once you have a violation. So that would make his value as a director of operational maintenance. Uh, you know, he'd lose that job too. So he'd well, go back. He'd go back to turning wrenches, which is not, you know, it's not the end of the world. But uh, he climbed up uh, to this position, but he. He occupied the position, but he didn't understand the position. Yeah, well, you know, he was asking somebody to compromise their own personal integrity and stuff, you know, for his own personal gain. And, you know, the message I think out there to our audience is, you know what, it's all about your own personal character and integrity. And um, and you don't want to compromise that because you lose that. Your, your career in aviation is pretty much done. So. Yeah, once they know it, right? Once they know it. Yeah. Well, you know, we we again we've seen we've seen the criminalization, if you will, of of you know at least outcomes. We saw that where you know value jet, there was a, a lot of criminal activity, 
um, that arose out of the value jet investigation. Of course, this one um, and, you know, mechanics and pilots are, are being not only violated, but, uh, you know, if it was an intentional act or you know, everything that in aviation is a federal offense. And it's funny how I keep running across people who think that, uh, you know, whether you fly it, fix it or manage it, that it's acceptable to uh, to eat, you know, <laughs> special brownies or eat special gummies because they can do it in their own particular state legally. You got to remember that, you know, the states don't regulate aviation. The feds do, the FAA, and it is still a federal offense to uh, to ingest any kind of, you know, quote, illicit drug in the feds book, which is marijuana or anything with THC or above, you know, cocaine and heroin and everything else. So now it's a. Uh, it's an interesting world. It's an interesting dynamic right now, John. And again, people have to be very introspective about what they're doing in aviation and what they're willing to give up if uh, if they are going to compromise their principles, their morals, um, and, and challenges to their own integrity. So it's, uh, it's this is a perfect accident that shows how you had two different independent groups, pilots and a mechanic or the maintenance department, um, who, again, for the interest of making a buck, tried to keep the metal moving and damn near cost them their life. They were very, very fortunate that that elevator separated on the ground. It would have been interesting if it had separated in the air because at those speeds, it could have done more damage to the aircraft than just a takeoff speed. So. Right. right. And and if it even stayed attached, flapping out there, it would have caused stability problems. And Ed, a good thing was in California and Nevada, that there's not a lot of clouds. Very rare to get a lot of clouds. Do that in the in the in the summertime now in North Carolina. Yeah. Well, you're <laughs> in thunder, you're in thunderstorms all the time. You know, the yeah. outcome could have been a lot different. Yeah. Well, since this was, uh, you know, involving a pre-flight, I'm going to leave you with our last words then. Okay. So, and again, everybody that flies, please, please listen. If you're going to go fly and do a good pre-planning session, do a, one from home, do another one when you get to the airport, make sure you're checking the weather. Right? And we have some new tools. I just, I was just reading the story that we have some new weather tools that are much more accurate that are just yep. coming online now. So please utilize all the resources that you have available to pre-plan your flight. And then when you get out to that airplane, do a good pre-flight. Get somebody that knows the damn airplane better than you to walk around with you. A different yeah. set of eyes. What do they look at that you might not be looking at and vice versa. So get out there, do a good look. You know, and that includes making sure the cockpit, you do the, you do the uh, checks on the cockpit, the switches and all the rest of it to make sure it's done. I see pilots that don't do hardly any of that. And when you get in the air, put your head on a swivel. A lot of new pilots out there, you know, and we know what happens with small airports. We always manage to have several collisions each year in and around the, you know, 500 feet or less around the airports and you'd shake your head and how they got into those positions, including one airplane landing on top of another one. Just, just amazing what, what can happen. Yeah. So please, please pay attention and fly safely. Thank you for checking out our show. We really value our listeners and subscribers. Our podcast gets ranked by you and how much you like it. So please give us five stars in your podcast platform. We want to keep in contact with you. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and of course, YouTube. You can email the show at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. By the way, if you're on YouTube, we're really working on growing the channel, and it helps if you all send in comments. Please do that, and we read all the comments. And be sure to subscribe. Remember, if you're in the market for aviation insurance, you can save 5% with Avemco just by mentioning our show. Visit them at www.avemco.com. 
That's it for this episode of the Flight Safety Detective. Until the next episode, fly safe.